IIS has really uh, opened its doors to the Global Philanthropy Forum and uh, made us feel very much at home, so thank you so much. Um, you will be seeing more of IIS throughout the day. You'll be seeing today and tomorrow, David, but also the second plenary will be chaired by Christopher Chaiba, who is co-chair of the Center for International Security and Cooperation. And the first panel tomorrow morning will be chaired by uh, David's deputy, uh, and that's Chip Blacker. Um, the Global Philanthropy Forum was founded uh, uh, almost two years ago, it depends how you count, uh, by men and women who would like to see the benefits of globalization more evenly shared. And so what you're going to find is a conversation amongst people who have equity as one of their uh, key goals. Many of you took part in last year's conference and many of you have taken part in the programs that we've held in between. But I want to welcome especially the newcomers uh, and to say a word about our style. When you think about this gathering over the next two days, don't think in terms of a conference. Don't think of a seminar. Don't think of a series of lectures. Imagine you're in a village green and that you're a part of a collective of individuals who've got a shared interest in solving very large problems. And when you think about this village green, uh, I ask that you see it as a neutral forum. Not neutral in the sense of that we don't have values, and of course philanthropy is always values-based, but neutral in the sense that all ideas are welcome. You're going to meet uh, people that we've convened from around the world who are true experts in their field, who have extraordinary knowledge and experience to add to yours. Uh, but we've invited you because you have extraordinary knowledge and experience to add to theirs. So we hope this is a give and take, a conversation throughout the next two days. Um, at meals today, at lunch and at dinner, they will be hosting tables. Please sit with someone you don't already know and share best practices and lessons learned. Now, we've chosen uh, more than an ambitious agenda. I mean, this is a, a truly daunting, a, a huge topic, the topic of poverty. And so we have asked Nancy Birdsall if she would open up the day uh, and provide us an overview of the problem. Most speakers are only uh, sort of allotted 10 minutes. We're asking Nancy to take a little more time so that she can unbundle the problem of poverty in ways that can not only be understood, but can be acted upon. Uh, and we've also asked her to pay some special attention to the role of the developed world. Uh, that is to say, many of us. Um, that's Nancy's immodest task. Now here's yours. Get to know her. Nancy will be with us, like all the speakers, for the full two days. She will serve as a resource to us. Please take advantage of that. After hearing from Nancy, we then have the honor of hearing from Grasa Michelle, uh, who traveled all the way from Africa last night to be with us, uh, but is looking well rested nonetheless. She's someone else that you'll really want to get to know. She's the former First Lady of Mozambique. She's the former uh, uh, Minister of Education and Culture in Mozambique. She now heads a, a foundation committed to community development. She's her partner in social change, is also her partner in life, and that's Nelson Mandela. Uh, she's an extraordinary leader, uh, and uh, she's going to ground our conversation in her real-world experience, both as a policymaker and as a social entrepreneur. For the remainder of the day, uh, we're going to take part in a whole series of panels that are led by people who are themselves revolutionaries in, in the field. Very large ideas and very small grants that came from philanthropists who had the foresight and the wisdom to take a chance, to take a risk. Uh, and they'll be the first that will argue to you that new uh, leaders are emerging every day from unexpected places uh, in unanticipated ways. And it is the challenge of philanthropy 
to not only identify them, but give them the tools they need uh, to change our world. We're going to spend today and the first half of tomorrow focused on the developing world, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, Asia. But then at noon tomorrow, we're going to turn our focus abruptly back to the developed world where Nancy uh, will have started us out. And we're going to take a look at our own role, our own practices, both personal and uh, in business, and our own governmental policies, and ask the question, how do those actions, those practices, and those policies either ameliorate uh, the problem of poverty or, in some cases, exacerbate the problem? We're going to end tomorrow with a call to action uh, from a woman whose family heard that call a very long time ago, uh, Peggy Delaney. Four generations ago, the Rockefellers helped really pioneer and uh, shape international philanthropy as we now understand it. We're also going to hear from someone who's entered the world stage in a very different way and take it advantage of the spotlight that he attracts uh, to good effect, to advance the common good, and that's Bono. Uh, for those of you who are my age or older, he normally sings. Um, Bono, uh, he gets the last word. Um, Before I close, let me just note that we're going to be focused for these two days on solutions because that's our nature. Uh, but we're here because of a problem, and that problem is that poverty persists. Uh, there are states that cannot govern. There are places, large parts of the world, where nature no longer provides. And while we're all very aware that the global economy has created great wealth, uh, and what economists refer to as its uh, rational distribution. Uh, the invisible hand of the market does not provide for equity. It does not meet all the dangers that exist. That's the role for philanthropy and good policy. And so we're here to advance both. That's the goal. I'm going to ask Nancy Birdsell and Grasse and Michelle to make their way to the stage and ask that while they do, the rest of us pause for a moment, for a moment of quiet and a moment of calm, uh, to listen to and to hear the voices of the poor. with sadness. There's no peace in my life. I feel sad when someone walks through here and sees how we live. The doctor prescribes medicine, and you don't have money to buy it, and your child might be very sick in the night. You just watch the child die, and you don't have money to do anything about it. Poor workers like us don't get the rights we deserve. Our boss has us do work and then doesn't pay us. I can hardly feed myself. Inflation is so high now. How can I support a family? From India, to Brazil, to Bosnia, to Uganda, they speak in different languages, 
but often about the same thing. Powerlessness and an inability to participate in making decisions that affect their lives. Living with vulnerability and risk and a lack of real opportunity. The problems that poor people face, complex and interlinked, have no easy solutions. The Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, Jane. What a wonderful introduction you gave uh, to the great challenges we face. It's really an honor and a privilege to have this opportunity to start off this session. In, and it's great fun to see some old friends who've been engaged in trying to make the world a better place for a very long time. I, I have a simple message, Jane summarized it already. It is that there is a terrible problem of poverty and inequality in the world, but it can easily be fixed. It is not an intractable problem. It's something that all of us can help address. So what I want to do is just give a few introductory remarks about what the problem is, and then give you an example of something we've done at the Center for Global Development to help think about what the rich can do to address the problem of global poverty. So let me start by repeating something you just saw uh, on the brief documentary. World poverty is a terrible thing at the human level. Um, you know, I'm a policy wonk. And so I'm going to give you a few numbers, but it's difficult to be a policy wonk and precede Grasa Michel, who is going to give you the real picture. Uh, so I hope you'll bear with me and think of this policy wonk stuff for the next two days as background to uh, what we really feel at the human level. The numbers that the policy wonk people know are that there are a billion people living in the world uh, at one dollar a day or less, and two billion people surviving on two dollars a day or less. You just got a sense from the voices of the poor what that means in daily terms. It means things like, in Kenya, only 15 percent of the roads are paved. It means that Bono has told us that there will be 25 million orphans in Africa in 10 years. It means that if you're a 13-year-old girl in Cambodia, Nepal, or Mali, you don't go on to school because your parents are afraid that you'll be assaulted sexually when you leave the village. It means that parents feel powerless. There has been progress, however. Countries like China and India have brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the last decade. A country like Uganda has doubled primary school enrollment in the last decade. The Brazilians instituted a, pr a process, a program to deal with their AIDS problem and have cut dramatically the number of people who are dying of AIDS. This kind of progress doesn't come about, as you all know, by accident. It comes about because people are trying to understand the problem and trying to make a difference and coming along with all kinds of initiatives and actions. The one that I really want you to focus on for a few minutes today and then later tomorrow is that in amongst all of the initiatives by private individuals, there's something that's very important, harder to deal with, talked about by people like me in Washington who are policy aficionados, and that is public policy. What are governments doing? 
it makes such a huge difference. Changing what governments do and what the international community at the official level does leverages tremendously the actions of people who are taking steps to deal with microcredit, to deal with health issues, to uh, create social entrepreneurs. Governments make a difference. And there are two categories of governments that make a difference. The first and the most important is the governments of the poor countries. They make a tremendous difference. If they're predatory, if they're corrupt, if they engage in conflicts, fighting over diamonds, fighting over gold, they condemn their own citizens to another generation of poverty. But, and they bear, that's where the major changes have to come. That's what the World Bank works on. That's what other global institutions like the IMF that you hear so much about are working on. It's also true, however, that the policies of the rich world make a huge difference. And that's the area where there's been much less work. That is what the Center for Global Development, uh, which we founded about 18 months ago, has decided to concentrate on. There isn't enough work on how what the rich countries do and what the citizens of the rich countries press their own countries to do can make a difference in reducing world poverty and reducing this gap in inequality between the rich and the poor. There are two ways to think about the problem that globalization poses for uh, reducing global poverty. The first is that there are things out there that just aren't fair. There are rules, there's a system that is rigged to use the words of one very important group, Oxfam, that works on global poverty. The rules are rigged. The best example is trade rules, and I'll come to that in a moment. The second reason, which Jane also referred to, is that the, in the invisible hand of the market doesn't in itself necessarily create equal opportunity. Those who are already rich, those who already have education, those who already have parents, they say in Silicon Valley, who are prosperous and educated, they are going to have more opportunities than the child born to parents or say to a, a mother who's where the spouse has died, the mother has AIDS, there's no school in the village, uh, there's civil conflict and so on. These are the two big problems with the globalization system as we know it. And many of you will know that there are two schools of thought about globalization. There's the school of thought, which I think is best characterized by Tom Friedman, whose book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, sang the sort of the praises of a global system. They're the cheerleaders for globalization. And they emphasize that China and India, when they joined the market system, have reduced poverty, that uh, that poverty reduction has, for the first time in world history, brought us fewer people overall in absolute poverty today than 10 years ago. That's the cheerleaders. And then there are the cynics who point out that these rules are unfair, that there's no real system to provide equal opportunity in the poorest countries, and so on. Of course, the truth lies somewhere in between these two schools of thought. Now, I want to go back to my example now of how we in this country and in other rich countries can think about the problem of global poverty and begin to address it by beginning to address the policies of our own countries that make a difference. Since I'm in the U.S. myself and I'm in Washington and now we're here in California, obviously the U.S. is the most important among the rich countries. It's the biggest, it has the most leverage, it has the most potential for leadership. So in showing you our example of uh, how rich countries can make a difference, I'll try to refer especially to the role of the U.S. and its shortcomings up to now. 
But what I want you to think about now and for the rest of the time is the link between these policies of the rich countries and what American citizens can do. And I want you to think about it in terms of how can you have a role in changing the overall policies of this country toward the poor world. So let's see. We want to do up or down. Uh, I can't see through the ferns. I'm going to introduce to you a, um, something called the Commitment to Development Index. And this is um, the heart and soul of what the Center for Global Development is about. It's, uh, we're about changing the policies of rich countries. And we decided that in order to do that, we had to capture people's attention. So we developed this index. And why? Rich country policies matter for development. It's time to hold rich countries accountable. And we need a tool that helps people like you and me do that. What are the goals of the CDI? It's to educate and inspire to action rich world public and policymakers and motivate a race to the top. Spark new research and data collection because understanding can make a difference to action and foster debate. You know, another way to put it is that it's to cut through the polarized debate between the activists who were in the streets of Seattle some years ago and just last week in Geneva saying we've got to dismantle a global system and the mainstream establishment, which is looking the other way and too often not even thinking about the problems that globalization or the challenges that globalization brings for reducing poverty. What is this index? It's a measure of policy effort uh, across 21 of the richest countries in the world. It's about effort, not impact. Maybe I won't talk too much about this because I think I only have maybe five minutes left. Um, well, let me just say it's a, it's a measure of Im effort, not impact. The example that's most important for the U.S. is the following. If the U.S., because it's big, changes its policy sometimes a little bit in the right direction, that could have a tremendous effect on some groups of developing countries. If Denmark makes a change, it might not make that much of a difference. However, this index doesn't measure impact. It measures the effort in the U.S. versus the effort in Denmark. And it does that by correcting for size. Uh, the components of the index are aid, trade, investment, environment, migration, and peacekeeping. You'll see what I mean. The first thing we tried to measure in terms of effort is aid. We looked at the quantity of aid relative to GDP. We adjusted quantity for quality, taking into account debt service received. You'll hear more about debt, I hope, uh, in the next couple of days, the problem of debt in poor countries. We took into account the extent to which aid provided by countries like the U.S. is tied to the countries needing to buy U.S. services or aid from Germany tied to countries needing to use German consultants, German services. Many of you will have read about the controversy around the Halliburton uh, contracts. Is it Halliburton? One of those um, in Iraq. Well, is it tied aid or not? Um, and we made an adjustment to reflect selectivity. I'll explain that in a moment. Well, here we go. The example of selectivity with aid is that $100 million of aid to Tanzania is booked at full value because Tanzania is a poor country with relatively good governance. It has relatively little corruption. It has a competent, effective system. The same could be said of Mozambique. The same $100 million in aid 
to Russia is discounted. It counts as 50 million in this index because Russia is not as poor. And given that it's relatively rich, it has relatively high levels of corruption. So that transfer is less likely to be used effectively. The results of ranking our 21 countries are discouraging if you're an American because uh, the U.S. is at the bottom of this barrel, giving 0.1% of GDP in public transfers each year compared to Denmark's 1% of its GDP. Private giving would not change this picture all that much. It would double, at most, the United States' contribution if you didn't take into account private giving from other countries like Japan and Italy, maybe the United States would move up in the ranking from 21st to 20th. So it's public giving that matters tremendously. In fact, it matters so much that the other corrections we made for Tide Aid and for selectivity, though they do matter, they wouldn't change these rankings much. Trade is probably the most, the single most other important factor in the way rich countries affect poor countries. We did an aggregate measure of the protection that rich countries afford their own industries and sectors in tariff equivalent terms, taking into account tariffs, non-tariff barriers, and subsidies. Now here's a confusing example, but what it is about is agriculture. Some of you will know that in the last year, the U.S. passed a farm bill that increased subsidies that taxpayers in the U.S. provide to their own farmers. Uh, in, in a sector like cotton, U.S. Subs now subsidizes cotton producers at an average level of over $100,000 per producer. Most of the billions in agricultural subsidies in this country go to relatively few producers. So these subsidies are not even equitable within the U.S. But those U.S. subsidies to cotton producers at 100,000 plus have absolutely devastated cotton farmers in Mali. The losses to cotton farmers in Mali in are in the hundreds of millions, but more important, they're in that their children can't go to school, that their governments don't have the resources to build roads to deal with the AIDS pandemic, um, et cetera. Okay, so the equivalent, the protection and tariff equivalents in agriculture is shown here, and what it shows is that tariffs matter, subsidies matter, and the total matters as well. Actually, the United States even with that farm bill, is much better off. We are a more open economy than all of Europe. Here's a case where the U.S. could take more leadership in pressing the Europeans to reduce their agricultural protection, except it's very hard to do that and get up on the bully pulpit when we've passed this farm bill in the last year. It's taken a little bit of the fire out of the belly, let's say, of our United States trade representative in the world, in the negotiations. In any event, here are the trade results. You see that the United States score is highest. Uh, and ironically, Norway, which is one of the best countries in aid, is among the worst in trade. There's little coherence in policies across within countries. Uh, we also looked at investment, which looks at the quantity of investment in developing countries relative to GDP. And we discounted it by a measure of bribe payers, a bribe payers index developed by Transparency International. Um, and as a result, that shifts around countries. Here you see that the U.S. is in the middle. 
Let me go quickly to environment, which measures uh, mostly the depletion of the shared commons by the rich countries on the view that they have a responsibility to minimize that depletion and to maximize efforts to uh, have collective action at the global level to address the problem of global warming. It also includes contributions to international efforts, multilateral environmental funds, and so on, and support within countries for clean technologies. Sadly, and I see Tim Worth sitting near me, uh, someone who has spent a lifetime thinking about these issues, the United States is at the bottom of this barrel, too. In migration, which measures uh, inflows each year of um, people from developing countries that can come to the rich countries in order to earn a better living. The U.S. is in the middle of the pack at best. And then we also tried to measure something called peacekeeping by contributions of different countries to U.N.-approved peacekeeping operations around the world. Uh, the overall scores put the U.S. 20th out of 21, ahead only of Japan. We can do more about all of this. We can focus more on making the aid process work better. Uh, we can think about migration policies within the U.S. itself. We can work to improve even the U.S.'s trade policies, which are in many respects, unfair. That is one mechanism, a very policy-driven, data-driven, analysis-driven kind of agenda that requires support from those who are concerned with the major challenge of the 21st century, reducing global poverty and reducing the tremendous and growing gap between those who are very rich and privileged and those who are very poor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. Please join me in welcoming Grasa Marshall. She's president of the Foundation for Community Development, and she's chairperson of the National Organization of children in Mozambique. Among her many accomplishments is that she's the author of the United Nations Report on the Impact of Armed Conflict on Children. Welcome. Thank you, Jane. And uh, thank you, Nancy, because I think you have uh, really put the audience quite in, in tune on uh, what maybe I'm going to say. You gave a much broader picture, and now I'll try to bring you to the micro level. I was Minister of Education for about 13 years, and uh, I felt I should uh, change and do something else. One of the problems is because every year the balance of what we would have uh, accomplished would be statistics. How many schools we have built, how many uh, children got assets, how many, everything was just in statistics. Although there was progress, but I, I failed to, to feel the touch with the real people. And um, because the last years of uh, my tenure in government were terribly affected by the conflict which uh, was going on in Mozambique, every morning I would get in my desk uh, telegraphs, and we didn't have internet, of, by the way, those days. So they would send me a telegraph and say how many teachers have been killed, how many children have been abducted. and So I started to become very, very concerned with children. So when I left government, I said, let me try to do something to concentrate in improving the lives of children. 
But then soon when we started to organize ourselves, we realized mm -mm, you can't do well for children if you don't do it for the mothers. And we realized also, I mean, mothers and children and women and children alone in a family, well, they will make a difference. But you need to look at the family and you, look, you need to look at the community in which they live. That's why we, we came with my colleagues to this concept of the Foundation for Community Development. To think of social change but based in a community. The second lesson which we all know is that in Africa especially, issues of poverty are equally daunting both in urban and rural areas but yet really worse in rural areas. Rural population are in a situation where there is no comparison when you look at uh, the so-called um, development indicators. The levels of malnutrition, levels of illiteracy, levels of health, I mean the coverage of health, coverage of education, coverage of communication, in, in terms of media. All the indicators are worse in rural areas. So we thought, let's concentrate. Not that we ignore the urban poverty, but let's concentrate on rural poverty. You know, also when there is a crisis, like it was in my country, we had war, we many times have also um, natural disasters. The areas of the country in which the impact is much greater, it's exactly in rural areas. Even the phenomenon of migration, people living, especially young people, living rural areas to town, but in our part of the world, in Southern Africa, there's migration to all the countries, especially to South Africa. You go to Lesotho, to Swaziland, to Zambia, any of our countries, have a serious level of migration, and those who live mainly are men, but living from rural areas. Or well, sometimes they live to, for towns, but living from rural areas, which leaves them, the rural areas, in a position where, in terms of productive force, you will find much more women, children, and elderly. So the crisis is bigger. In challenges of today, we do not have uh, uh, statistics to prove this, although we know that AIDS has its greater impact in rural areas. I say we do not know because in many places we don't even have uh, uh, facilities for people to get tested. We just calculate, we see the trends and the way people die in families and you can evaluate that yes, it must be AIDS. But we, we can't prove, although we sense that is the case. That's why, in terms of uh, trying to tackle poverty in any, I would say, I can be comfortable to say in any African country, but at least in the experience of Mozambique, rural areas are decisive. Even if in urban areas you have poverty, at least in terms of getting closer to a hospital, to a school, to information, urban areas are relatively well off. But in rural areas, people are mostly illiterate. They don't have newspapers. Only radio can get there. There's no television. So even to get messages through, to get through to them, it's, you have to use these sort of, sorry, sort of face-to-face -face discussions while you are spreading, of course, the system of education. So the first lesson for us is that rural areas have to be the focus. But it is true that the entry point for rural poverty in our understanding is, one, help to organize peasants 
so that they can have income, so that they can have food, at least to put food at the table every day. Without that, even if you have them with education, if you have them with health, but without food, there's no way out. So we learn to combine one line of what we call income generation and the other line which is of human development, if you can say, human development indicators, which go to expanding education facilities, expanding health facilities, including vaccines, and I'll come to this, to expand water, access to the clean drinking water, and of course, with the concurrence of other institutions then, to make roads so that things will get there, you'll reach the most remote areas of the, of the country. Now, in terms of the human, I mean social groups, we learned that if you are to try to break the cycle of, of, of the cycle of poverty, you have to concentrate on children and women. Children because are the, 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 the turning point of a situation where you are, going to, you are not going to carry on for the next 30, 50 years dealing with the same problems. You have to look at the little ones and give them a chance of one, to be born, to live, and not to die. Second, to grow healthy, which means to get vaccines. Third, to make sure that they can go to school. Because if they have knowledge, if they have skills, then they will start life in a much different basis than their parents, who were, of course, are still very poor. So you turn the, the trends of the cycle, cycles of poverty concentrating on the young ones, on the little ones. But for change today, for social change today, women are crucial. Not only because, as I said, in rural areas, they are, as you know also, they are the ones who grow food and so forth, but because in terms of uh, social change, women are the engine even to change social relations in our case. When you empower women to wake up in the morning and they have something in their hands to know how to plan, they can think of a month, they can think of a year, and they can think of three years, you give the family better conditions to know what they're going to eat, how they're going to school, how all these basic social things which are needed. In our case, a specific case, those who plan better and they do it, they're women. But then there is the other thing, is that in social relations, to continue the way we, in uh, patriarchal societies, we look at women and men differently. If you are to change that, give a woman an opportunity to internalize her rights. Because she knows about her duties, but her rights, and to exercise her rights. If she does, then they, her children, and the relations in the family will change. So we believe that to try to break the cycle, you concentrate on children and you concentrate on, on, on women. And of course, if uh, we, we, we are to give some examples, even in terms of uh, if we look at the Millennium Development Goals, well, it's women who die of a very simple thing like giving birth. So, if you want to improve this, this you have to look at the health system and how it serves women. If we look at, um, again, to levels of how mortality child, infant and child mortality affects societies. You educate the woman, you give a, a possibility for a vaccine, children will be vaccinated and children, I mean infant mortality will reduce. So just to give some examples of, uh, even in domestic violence, which is not only of uh, societies like ours, but it's also existent here. When 
a woman can assert, affirm herself, of course she is not going to accept to be abused as easily as if it would happen in our societies where she is in a lower status. So for us, it is also a process of uh, helping this, but to change the status of women in society. And for that effect, social change. When I say we, who are we? It is a foundation um, for community development, as I mentioned. And uh, we elected the most, um, the less developed provinces of our country, which is the northern part of the country, to start with these programs. We do grant making. But I want to say our grant making is not necessarily in terms of what grant making means here. And I'm not going to develop that. But we do grant making. And we really try to combine isolated actions and integrated actions which with other partners will contribute to in some areas to provide, as I was saying, to improve agriculture, including to give Livestock, we say livestock, to women. We directly give it to women. Whether they are small or big ones, but to give them something which represents wealth to women. We expand education with a very strong component of girls' education. In every school where we help to improve the conditions, we train the teachers, we create committees with parents and community leaders to make sure that girls will get assets will remain in school and will be successful at least to complete basic education. But we also give uh, scholarships to children who, to girls who complete primary, but they have no possibility to continue to secondary and even to go to, 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 to tertiary education. That is to give to those areas where the levels of girls are sex is so low, at least that in 15 years, you will have a pool of girls who went through the barrier of the primary, they went to the secondary, they went to the tertiary. Even we go as far to make sure that she is not going to be just a lawyer, but we encourage them and we create a system to encourage them to go to engineers, for instance, to go to science, which in our case, in rural areas, it's extremely difficult for them to have, I mean, an idea of how to get to uh, the, technological, the technological area. But we also are concerned that these, these schools shouldn't perpetuate the gap between schools in urban areas. So we decided to introduce a program of what we call Bridging the Gap. And it's to introduce the new technologies for children at two last classes of the primary so that at least a child will know what a computer is, will know how to get into internet and so forth. When they leave primary school, even if they don't have a chance to go to the secondary, at least they will be open up to the world. It's important for us because there's a system which separates the gap, which increases the, the gap between not only the developed and the developing world, but between the rural and the urban. I'd like also to talk now about improving vaccines facilities. Uh, Blaise Sato will tell you, some of you who will be for one of the breaking sessions to, to explain exactly what it is. But it's a, a, a very good model of a, of a partnership between our country and an organization which is in this part of the world, in Seattle, to exactly to improve the system of uh, distribution, storage, and even the effective vaccine for children. And it's making, it is making a very, very good, good impact. I think also we are doing things which are important, not only in terms of program. Of course, we have an AIDS program which goes to schools also, and we also in, uh, uh, in, in uh, geographical context in which we have young women, militaries, police, miners, truck drivers, as the groups which we concentrate in AIDS education. But because we recognize the importance of a very vibrant civil society in Mozambique, 
in that case we feel it's extremely important that we have a connection of helping citizens to organize themselves to make their voice heard and we support for that NGOs but we help also NGOs and CBOs but we help to establish networks which will strengthen connections amongst organizations in civil society field so that they will be able to assert their interests but also to negotiate with the state and to negotiate actually also with the friends outside Mozambique. That helps to raise, I mean, the face and the voice of citizens, which we believe is extremely important. But we also have groups, we support groups which uh, are networks, but they are advocacy groups. That issue which was, was referred here, a huge agenda on girls' education nationwide and the regional African wide, education for all, and actually even regional campaigns, groups which are campaigns against women and child abuse. Why do we try to do all this? It's because in our context, being a grant maker, it's, 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 we can't have the luxury of only concentrating on health issues or in education or in water because even I, I think it's clear for what I said why we have to do this but we build all these connections where we don't need necessarily to be as doing but in terms of impact where we are working someone else has to bring, bring inputs which uh, we are not able to give ourselves otherwise then in terms of results it becomes very very difficult I think I would like to mention this issue of policy, which uh, uh, Nancy quite rightly did raise, and more importantly, the issue of uh, agricultural subsidies. Literally, these subsidies in this part of the world, in Europe, are taking out bread from the mouth of our children, especially of rural children, if I want to put it graphically. Because it's, it's no longer possible to have a viable agriculture in a poor country like ours when we have to compete with farmers who are highly subsidized and then who dump, literally, the dump products here, which are much cheaper than ours because our costs literally are much more higher. I think that's a very important issue if we are to build the dignity of African people to produce f food for themselves and not to have to be receiving it from someone else. I think it's important I'm now, my time is out. I wanted to send a message of hope. Africa is organizing itself. It may not be clear here. Just last year, in terms of conflict, le led by our leaders, we have settled the conflict in the Congo. We have settled the, the conflict in Burundi. Angola, as you know, is in its way of putting the house in order. Sudan is in process of negotiations which are promising. That's to say, yes, Africa is the country, the continent you hear of, but there's a new trend which is coming from Africa of changing in a positive change. Second, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, civil society networks, which are national, regional, sub-regional, and regional, which means there is a growing movement which is coming from grassroots up in terms of affirmation and assertive civil society which is trying to dialogue with its states, but also to be able then to connect with you. Within the large frame framework of Millennium Development Goals, we believe we are in the right track and we are in a position in partnership with you then to build a different continent, a different world. Just one thing. If SARS had started in, in China 20 years back, it would have killed many Chinese. 
but I hardly believe it would have affected in a question of hours Toronto. But in our world today, as it happened in China, the following day, the virus was already in Toronto. What does it mean in terms of graphically showing the so-called global village in which we are? There's no way we can ignore what's happening wherever it is in the corner of the globe. We are in the same boat. Either we sink together or we reach the show together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nancy gave us a glimpse in the, uh, at the nature of the problem and the need for, for sound and sensible policies both in poor countries and wealthy countries. And Grasa Machel has given us a sense of uh, a glimpse at the nature of the solution in terms of investments in, in children and in women, in education, in health. Uh, and, uh, and in civil society. But most importantly, what you've done has left us with a sense of hope that, in fact, civil society uh, is, is becoming a, a more vibrant civil society is emerging. We have time for some questions, and we have roving microphones. Uh, there is a microphone. There is a microphone. So just raise your hand, and they will come to you. And here are two over here. Then I'm going to ask the first question. Yeah, yeah. There's someone um, there. As you get to that, the first question I wanted to ask is that there's a $14 billion AIDS initiative by the U.S. government, and I wanted to get a sense um, from, uh, from both of you, in fact, the degree to which you think this is, uh, this is, going to, this is a well-conceived program and will, in fact, advance, uh, help us deal with a very large problem. You, I, can, I can. You can. You, you'll add. Of course, the, the announcement of the $15 billion for AIDS uh, is uh, a welcome and very good news. There are some concerns, uh, though, that this, this money is not going through the global fund for AIDS. Apparently, the, the administration in this country has its, its own way of how to channel those resources to uh, countries who will be eligible according to criteria which are being defined. In short, I will say it's mostly welcome. It is going to make a difference. But I think it would be, important, it would be even more important if these resources are being channeled through the global channels which have been agreed by the international community, in this case, which is the Global Fund for AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and tuberculosis, because it would strengthen and give the ability to a multilateral institutions to work. But it is, it is, it is not, no doubt, I mean, a good, a good indication. Uh, we just hope that in the, uh, along this process, maybe with the support of institutions like uh, the CDI, which we are talking about, we should be able to manage to bring this to the mainstream of the global channels of multilateral institutions to strengthen our common security so that we don't go in unilateralism. This is my Portuguese now speaking, it's not English. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, I think that's very well put. There are two issues about that need a lot of attention, a lot of monitoring, a lot of healthy persuasion from the American public on what is really a very important initiative of the Bush administration. It is a little bit like when Nixon went to China, when the Bush administration decides to do a major program that will be so important, especially in Africa. There are the two, is two issues, though. One is this issue of its being seeming very unilateral, at least as a start. I think that can be addressed, mm -hmm. uh, including through Congress over the next several years and mm -hmm. even, even immediately. What is good is that Congress has set it up in a way that is also a challenge for the Europeans. Uh, there's an idea of the, a matching built into the legislation mm -hmm. that for every three billion, say, 
that comes from other countries then to the global fund, then one billion could come from the U.S. to the global fund. That's one issue. The second issue is related, however, and that is that it's a, we have an opportunity, instead of being unilateral, not only to be multilateral and coordinated in order to make these resource transfers effective, but to take leadership mm -hmm. in doing it in a multilateral way. And I think that's the big challenge for the American public, is to send the message that the U.S. needs to take leadership. The Europeans in this area and in other areas aren't going to do it. The Japanese aren't going to do it. Mm -hmm. Now some money is on the table that can be the vehicle for tremendous leadership in doing it well, in, a, in being sure that it doesn't create another set of burdens for countries that are suffering from the AIDS pandemic, because they need to meet another set of procurement guidelines. Uh, they need to talk to 55 more visitors mm -hmm. from USAID, from mm -hmm. the Global Fund, from the hundreds of other groups uh, and donors that are involved in the AIDS program, that they don't need to set up all kinds of mechanisms to ensure that the money is used in this way or that way, that it's used for abstinence programs in a sufficient amount versus condom, um, condoms and so on. So it is a great example that we all should work on to make the U.S. take back critical leadership in how aid is delivered to poor countries. Without that U.S. leadership, so much money is lost. Question. John Harvey, Grand Makers Without Borders. Nancy, in your presentation, you spoke positively of the IMF and the World Bank as being forces uh, to bring about less corrupt regimes in, in the global south. But many activists globally argue that the World Bank and IMF and other international and monetary institutions are negative forces uh, related to the kinds of things that you were discussing, uh, funding programs that bring about tremendous environmental destruction, uh, that in fact bring about uh, greater income disparities uh, within the global south. Um, and so I was a little, I, I have a question uh, on that and wondered if you have any uh, comment on, on that feedback. Yes, I'm glad you asked because I, I didn't really, I'm not sure I meant to speak positively, but I wouldn't speak negatively either. Both, both views are right. You know, the, these global institutions have been a positive force. We need them. It's a global system. As Grasso Michel just pointed out with her wonderful example of the SARS virus spreading, we need collective action at the global level. But these institutions are far from perfect. They have made mistakes. They can be uh, destructive. They can, t they can be intrusive. They can reduce the autonomy and the independence of countries. I think the issue, and that's part of what the Center for Global Development is about, it's just as there needs to be benign pressure on rich countries to have policies that are propitious for global development, so there needs to be benign pressure on our precious global institutions that they become positive forces for reducing global poverty. I won't try to say how now, mm. but I would say that the activist efforts have been incredibly important in already bringing about many uh, reforms of these global institutions. The last question. Um, good morning. I'm Vicky Gaichitorena from the Philippines. Uh, I'd like to talk about the issue of the uh, uh, migrant uh, people, especially migrant women, uh, from developing countries to developed countries like the United States and Europe, and the many social problems that uh, this goes along with it. While they may be able to send money back home for the education of their children, uh, their the nannies are taking care of the children of rich women at the same time that they're abandoning their own children back home. Um, and I wonder whether, uh, in terms of policy issues, uh, this could be discussed by uh, labor uh, departments around the developed countries. One, whether they could uh, think about uh, bringing the families of these um, uh, 
men and women whom they bring out of the developed countries into the develop from the developing countries to the developed countries so that at least they don't have the social problems of uh, separation and many many families led by single uh, parents uh, back home and the other is that uh, while the Country, the developing country like the Philippines invests in the education of our teachers and our, and our engineers. Uh, it is the developed countries that reap or harvest uh, these, um, uh, these investments and at the same time drain uh, from the developing countries this uh, pool of, for example, teachers now who are being attracted to the United States because of the shortage of teachers here. And I'm wondering whether there is some way of um, uh, balancing the equation, uh, so to speak, by these maybe more investment in the education of those countries where, let's say, the United States harvests uh, these um, nurses and, uh, and teachers from countries like the Philippines? Um, this is a great question. And um, let me start by saying the, the, the nature of the issues you're raising is what impelled us to put migration into that index that I showed you. And I didn't really have the time to talk about it, but you've raised two critical issues. One is the brain drain, or the people drain, that developing country taxpayers finance education and training, and then people come to rich countries, and the rich countries benefit. Um, and in fact, rich countries cream off some of the most talented people by making it easier and attractive to bring um, trained people here. The HB1 visas that some of you who are from Silicon Valley might know about were designed by the US to attract engineers <coughs> and technocrats. One of the, we're doing some work on the global war for talent and we're coming up with a proposal that would include tax sharing so that when um, nurses from Guyana and the Philippines and engineers from India come to the US and Europe, there could be bilateral tax agreements between rich and poor countries so that the poor countries would benefit from the tax collection efforts which are very efficient in the US uh, some of those taxes could be remitted to the poor countries to pay back in a sense um, that's one issue the second is in our um, measure we decided not to count illegal immigrants why because when it, it immigrants are illegal, it makes it much more difficult for them to, to gain from the protections and safeguards uh, in the countries where they're living. Uh, Vicente Fox from Mexico asked before September 11th that the U.S. take steps to make more of the Mexican immigrants legal in part so that they could get those protections, which among other things would make it easier for them to uh, meet their responsibilities in many ways. They could travel back and forth as parents, go back to see their children in a way that they can't now. These are, so you have captured some public policy issues that, that have to do with the way we in the rich world have organized our systems, sometimes unfairly, sometimes without conspiracy, but often in ways that instead of making life better in the poor world, actually add to burdens there. Kristen, did you want to have a final word on that? You're going to pass. I'm going to now break this session and ask that you take advantage of the fact that both Cross and Michelle and Nancy Brazil will be with us for two days, bring your questions directly to them, and uh, have a about a 20 minute break and we'll come back and Chris Tribal will lead a panel on health and education and human development. Thank you.